I'm grateful to my colleague, Rabbi Shapiro, for placing us in the story of the Akedah for a moment of silent prayer. Because this is what Jews do. We, we take a text and we place ourselves within it and we wrestle then with that text and try to understand the text from a particular point of view and what it might have to say to our lives. We've decided to offer a sermon at this spot in the service before we get to the Torah reading so that that story might be on your mind as we read it. This is the way that Torah study has worked within the Jewish community for centuries. Torah study is the central activity of the Jewish people. Torah has kept us alive in dark times. It has kept us thriving when times are better. And whether it's through a class or a Jewish novel that you read or a show that you watch with Jewish themes, that is all engagement. And at its heart, it is the same course of study that our ancestors engaged in, asking the very same questions as the ancient texts whose words filled the pages of the books that they carried with them on their journeys. Abraham awakens early. Having heeded the call to offer up his son, his favorite son, the one that he loves, on a mountaintop that God will show him. And how can Abraham possibly understand or make any sense out of this abhorrent command, this command which flies in the face of all reason, and every instinct which a parent feels, does he tell his beloved Sarah what he's about to do? Does he give himself even a moment to consider the consequences of disobeying, of challenging, of offering God some sobering demonstration of this inhumanity embedded in this request? And yet Abraham responds, Hineni. Here I am. Each time we approach even the simplest Torah tale, new questions arise to challenge and confront us and our lives become more meaningful from the guidance we receive. One of the most precious of these lessons is that when we hear Torah and its many stories, we have a choice to make about how we listen most of us grew up learning to hear and to understand Torah through our intellect rather than our hearts. And the truth is that while some stories might work that way, the Torah is better understood with the heart than with the head. And what does Abraham's head tell him on the three days journey towards his fate? What does his heart have to offer him? What, for that matter, does Isaac's heart have to offer him comfort? As he must suspect, surely he suspects the true nature of this unusual outing with his father. So often in life, we are Abraham and Isaac, walking alone together, confronting the reality of tragedy and loss when all we want is to bury our heads in one another's arms and weep. Yet we know that we can avoid the trauma of loss, not one iota, more than these two can. Far more weighty than the wood they carry, sharper by far than the knife, and holding them more tightly than any rope could are the broken hearts they carry up the mountain as they continue together. No amount of intellectualizing can bring this Torah into clearer light than the questions that we bring to Torah with our broken hearts. In the story of Adam and Eve, we see our own failures to care for our own Garden of Eden and to protect it. Within the relationships of Moses and Pharaoh, we hear our own struggle to speak truth to power. And in this most human of all stories, the tale of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac by his father, Abraham. The Torah's wisdom comes to us not from some plot twist 
or some divine saving grace, but rather in the recognition of our own destiny, in the sharp sadness of Abraham, the willing and attentive love of Isaac, the mournful and tragic death of Sarah. Let us not try too hard to understand the story with our head, but listen instead with our hearts. Our brains are ill-equipped to make sense out of something so very human as suffering. I remember the first time as a hospital chaplain that I entered a patient's room. Preparing for my first day at this new placement, I wondered what Torah I might bring along, which stories and teachings, which biblical characters would I need to evoke to address the needs of the families that I might encounter. Looking back now, I can tell you I had many stories, narratives, and laws at the ready, and none of that headwork prepared me to, meet, to speak to the hearts of patients. At UCLA Medical Center, the spiritual care department only received each patient's name and diagnosis, and it wasn't much to go on. Even so, I knew the first person on my schedule that day would not be leaving the hospital. And I was relieved when my assigned mentor, a more experienced Catholic chaplain, agreed to come with me. We paused at the hospital room door and she taught me a prayer, the first of many things that she would teach me. Her prayer was a request that our hearts be open to whatever lay behind that closed door. I had spent the long walk through the hospital corridors trying to plan out with my head what would happen in this patient's room, what I might be able to offer someone with a terminal illness. And as we stood by the patient's bedside, I expected that we would offer sympathy. We would explain that illness is not punishment from God, that tragedy is random. With the inexperience of youth, I thought Judaism teaches us to avoid pain that nothing good could ever come from illness, that suffering is an enemy to battle against, to vanquish, rather than a teacher who might have anything to teach. You can imagine my surprise then when my mentor began by asking, what has your cancer taught you? As of speaking to Isaac, already bound to the wood. And this Isaac, responded that day over almost an hour of lessons and insights that he derived from illness, a renewed love of life, a reordering of his priorities, a deeper love for his family. This man understood the language that the chaplain was speaking, and he was able to derive comfort when he shared his precious insights, life lessons, acquired at a very high price. There have been very few times that I also felt bound to my own altar of sacrifice. It was a Friday afternoon almost a decade ago when I called my wife, Tammy, to pick me up from the chiropractor's office. We were scheduled to lead services together that evening and it was becoming clear to me that something had gone very wrong that I was not going to be leading services on that Shabbat, nor many Shabbats to come. I never blamed the doctor for what had happened, but she had unintentionally caused a small tear in a blood vessel in my neck, which had traveled to my brain and caused a small stroke. I could not see or walk or maintain any sense of where I was. A few months later, a famous model was to experience a similar accident which would take her life. It took quite a while to understand the gravity of what I had experienced. It was a terrifying time for myself and my family as we waited to see what long-term effects I might experience. But it became clear almost immediately that I had narrowly missed something far more serious. Grappling with the thin line between life and death and understanding in my body how quickly that line could be touched or even crossed. It had left me with permanent mark. Isaac does not join his father on the journey down the mountain. 
After his ordeal, argue the sages, he goes away to recuperate alone. He needs that time from his father, perhaps, in order to understand this decree from above which held him to these series of events. In our Torah, Isaac is never the same. He never speaks to his father again, although he does reunite with his brother Ishmael to bury their father, to redig his wells which have run dry. I recovered fully in the months which followed, and my mental capacity, or most of it anyway, and short-term memory returned as well. Whenever I think of those days, I say a prayer of gratitude for the use of my body and my brain. I would gladly have never faced that trial, never suffered that fear or long recovery. But I also know that I could not be the rabbi, the counselor, the husband, the father, or friend I am today, were it not for the lessons I learned from my own brush with mortality and pain. Every one of us suffers at some point in life. We each face challenge and endure pain, both our own and that of our loved ones. As mortal creatures, it is not our choice whether we suffer or how or when, but we do have this power to choose how we respond. We choose whether to see ourselves as Abraham, finding strength within to overcome life's unfair nature, the trial of resilience, or whether we feel like Isaac or Sarah, whose resilience comes from deeper sources. Or perhaps we find ourselves this year in the ram, waiting at the end of the story for the knife to come down upon us. We have those years too. The meaning of suffering is to be found in the response to suffering. We respond in despair and we respond with resilience. Psychology will tell us that there are three indications of a strong resilience in an individual or a community. Confronted with trauma, are we able to continue to be our best selves? Can we function under high stress? And how well do we recover afterwards? The first Isaac I learned from at the hospital that day taught me what this looks like, as have many others since. With the help of my family, I experienced a test of my own resilience after my injury. And it is through this frame of resilience which the sages ask us to consider the story of the binding of Isaac. It is a profoundly uncomfortable tale of a God who demands the sacrifice of a child. We detest that Abraham is called to demonstrate faithfulness by offering up what he loves most. We resent the imposition of suffering in a world that is all too filled with pain and sorrow already. We are each of us Abraham, and we feel this trial of Abraham in our own heart as a version of our own life's trial. We perceive our own pain in his silent anguish. And we ask, who do we become in the moment that life tests us? Interestingly, the biblical word for test, nisayon, in modern Hebrew can also mean experience or experiment. For we alone can transform our tests into experience by ascribing meaning to them something that provides opportunity for new understanding and deeper connection. With our attitude, our trial transforms us. Why is Abraham's resilience tested? The sages imagine that his suffering was a necessary catalyst for depth and caring and meaning. Throughout his life, we note, Abraham had known only success, a beautiful and devoted wife, great wealth, prominence, a relationship with God. With all of that bounty, the sages ask, how could he have learned to empathize with others? How could he not have felt smug and superior to other people with their failure and their sorrows? 
How could he not blame them for their misfortunes? Perhaps suffering taught Abraham the one thing that his success in life could not. The Bible records no reason for this trial. Few of us ever know why we endure suffering and sorrow. But we do know that how we respond to our suffering has power to transform us for better or for worse. And aren't the hardest blows to take, the sufferings felt not by us ourselves, but by those we love the most, our children, our spouses, our parents, our friends. We feel helpless in the face of suffering of the innocent, God's decree seemingly immutable. Abraham learns from his trial it becomes a source of personal growth and spiritual depth. The mystical Jewish tradition recognizes a hint of that growth in the way that the angel calls out his name at the critical moment. Isaac is bound to the altar as Abraham raises the knife held high in the air. We read, an angel of God called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And why does the angel say Abraham's name twice? Rev. Chia writes that the angel repeated Abraham's name in order to animate him with a new spirit and to inspire in him a new heart. The spiritual sage argues that the angel shouted Abraham, Abraham, twice to show that, quote, this Abraham was not like the former Abraham. Having learned from this test, he was now a stronger Abraham while his former self was incomplete. Out of the horror of his suffering, Abraham changed. Abraham grew. The year we have concluded has been an extremely trying one for many of us here. Some have faced their own very personal trials. Some have lost loved ones on the altar of illness, heartbreak, or defeat. Others feel as if we are facing a test as a society here in America. Others more concerned about the test confronting our beloved homeland of Israel. A hundred years ago, in his commentary on Genesis, Rabbi Julian Morgenstern wrote, God tries everyone in some way. The real test is the way we offer our sacrifice the willingness with which we give up what is dear, the perfect faith in God which we still preserve and which keeps us from doubting God's wisdom and goodness. How and when we pass our tests will be determined by our capacity for resilience, the inner strength that we might offer one another and find deep in ourselves to grow and to learn, to accept. I choose to understand my perfect faith, not in some blind acceptance that God desires suffering, but that suffering and rejoicing are inevitable and intricately linked. We experience both in life with our heart. Both of them can and will lead us to wisdom and to goodness. And we pray, can ye hear us own? May this be God's will for us in the new year. Shana Tobah.